So next we have the second talk of the morning session with Alexander. All right. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Alex Delzell, uh, and I'm with the AWS Center for Quantum Computing. And this talk is going to be about quantum algorithms for solving the quantum linear system problem in near optimal and optimal complexity. So to begin, I'm going to lay out the definition of the quantum linear system problem uh, and lay the land for what we're trying to achieve in this talk. The quantum linear system problem is related to solving a system of linear equations like the one shown here, uh, where A is an M by N matrix containing the coefficients of M linear equations on N variables. We'll assume that A satisfies a certain promise on its uh, singular values. In particular, all of the non-zero singular values of A will need to lie in the interval between one over kappa and one, where kappa is uh, a parameter that's uh, basically re re related to this condition number of A. Uh, our algorithm will get worse as uh, kappa is increased, uh, which is a feature shared by other quantum and classical algorithms for solving linear systems. And if, you're, if it's been a while since you've thought about uh, singular value decompositions, you can think of singular values as just eigenvalues for the purpose of this talk, and you won't really uh, lose anything. So the idea here is that the eigenvalues, that singular values, can't be too close to zero. The goal of solving a linear system is to find the solution vector x, which contains these n components. Uh, but for the quantum computer, the task is going to be, is going to be slightly different. We're going to want to create this quantum state ket x, uh, which uh, is a superposition over n orthogonal basis states uh, with a coefficient that's proportional to the uh, component of the solution vector xi. We'll assume that ket x is a normalized state, so we we'll divide by this Euclidean norm of the vector x, and this Euclidean norm will play a, uh, an important role in the algorithm later. So then we can define the quantum linear system problem formally as follows. We're given as input A and B uh, that satisfy this normalization condition. We're promised that the uh, linear system is consistent, that it does have a solution. Um, or in other words, that B is in the column space of A. Uh, we, as our input model, we follow a uh, standard convention and we assume we have access to a unitary block encoding of the matrix A. That is a unitary with A in its upper left corner and a state preparation unitary that prepares the state ket B uh, from a, uh, computational basis state. Finally, we're given the value of kappa for which our A satisfies the promise on the previous slide, as well as a target precision parameter epsilon. And the goal is then to output a quantum state which approximates the state ket x up to epsilon error in some uh, choice of error metric. And here I've chosen the trace distance, uh, but one could also consider other error metrics and would uh, arrive at similar results. And then, of course, the goal is to design an algorithm that solves this problem while minimizing the number of queries that we make to these uh, matrices, to these uh, operations UA and UB that give us access to the uh, input data A and B. So this problem has a long history. Uh, it began uh, with the seminal work of HHL in 2008, uh, where they gave an algorithm that solves it in order kappa squared over epsilon uh, runtime. And what's remarkable about this is that it doesn't have any dependence at all on the size of the linear system. Uh, so n and m don't appear at all in the uh, number of queries that the algorithm has to make to these uh, block encoding um, uh, primitives. Of course, when they did this in 2008, we didn't really have uh, a sense of block encoding, but you can reinterpret their work in that language and come up with this, um, with this result. So over the course of many years, this was incrementally uh, improved uh, to the point where in 2021, we achieved optimal complexity, or I shouldn't say we, as some of the authors of this work are in the room today, um, which achieves optimal complexity uh, of kappa times log one over epsilon. And it's worth um, lingering for a second on how uh, this work and actually some of the work before it uh, actually make this happen. Um, particular, they uh, prepare the state ket x by following a uh, adiabatic path from a simpler state that's easy to prepare, which is related to the state ket b. So this is sort of a cartoon uh, version of, of what it's doing. Uh, it follows this adiabatic path to the state ket x. And the uh, innovation here that gave optimal complexity was to analyze a, a certain version of this using the, the discrete adiabatic theorem. 
And uh, the discrete adiabatic theorem and adiabatic theorem in general is very powerful, very general. Um, and so as a result, uh, while one can derive uh, optimal asymptotic complexity, the constant prefactors that come out of the analysis are quite large. Um, and uh, it's you know, unclear uh, that if they could be you know, made uh, completely tight with what we would expect the algorithm to perform in practice. Um, so the goal of this talk is going to be to uh, you know, give a, another algorithm, which is also optimal, has optimal complexity, uh, but is simpler in certain ways and also has uh, smaller constant prefactors. But why should we care about the constant prefactors? Um, well, it's because hopefully this algorithm will actually feature within uh, actual real world applications at some point in the future and actually be run on quantum computers. So we would like to have a real sense of exactly how many queries one would have to make uh, to, to use this within larger algorithms. Some of the proposed uh, problems uh, are in the realms of quantum machine learning, solving different differential equations numerically on a quantum computer uh, and certain tasks in convex optimization. So we should really be concerned about its practical efficiency in addition to its asymptotic efficiency. Okay, that concludes the uh, first part. Uh, the second part is going to be about the main technical tool that we'll use in our algorithm. And to use this tool, we're gonna need a matrix G for which X is in the kernel of the matrix. Uh, it's easy to construct such a matrix G uh, by uh, letting it be equal to the product of the orthogonal complement onto the linked M vector B multiplied by the M by N matrix A. And it's easy to verify that if X indeed satisfies the equation AX equals B, then if we plug it in uh, and we act uh, with G on X, we get the output zero. So this confirms that X is indeed in the kernel of G. A more non-trivial observation, um, which doesn't take that long to, to prove, but I omit it from this slide, is that if A satisfies this promise that all of its non-zero singular values lie between one over kappa and one, then G will also satisfy that promise. And this will be important on the next slide. And then finally, uh, we can easily build a block encoding for the matrix G using our block encoding for the matrix A, uh, and also one query to the state preparation unitary uh, for B and it's, in, and it's inverse. So how do we use the matrix G? We'll use it together with the quantum singular value transformation uh, to transform the singular values uh, and apply an approximate projection and reflection about the state ket X. So the quantum singular value transformation works is we can take the singular values of, of a matrix for which we have a block encoding and a polynomial that satisfies certain restrictions and apply that polynomial onto the singular values. So first let's consider this blue polynomial. Um, if we transform the singular values of G by the blue polynomial, we see that the singular value zero associated with the kernel is just mapped to one. So the kernel is preserved. Uh, however, all of the other singular values which lie in the region one over kappa to one will be suppressed by a, uh, down to a very small factor that's very close to zero. So the result is if we take an arbitrary state phi, and we apply this blue polynomial onto the singular values of G, we do an approximate projection onto the kernel of G, which is the state ket X. It's approximate because of these wiggles in this polynomial. This technique was called eigenstate filtering in uh, uh, prior work, uh, and we call it kernel projection, which is basically the same thing. Um, and yeah, so you can see here that the, the, the vector is subnormalized. It's like has smaller than unit norm, which uh, relates to the fact that this projection will uh, succeed with probability less than one. But the good news is that you get to know when it has succeeded and when it has failed. So you can just restart the algorithm if you observe some kind of failure. If instead of applying the blue polynomial, we apply the green polynomial, then instead of a projection, we'll get an approximate reflection. And that's because the portion of the state orthogonal to the kernel is gonna be applied with a minus one phase instead of a zero, um, a zeroing out here. Okay, that's the main technical tool. And now we're ready to move on to the main idea of the algorithm. So first I'd like to describe the main conceptual idea of what's going on in the algorithm. And I think it's pretty simple. Um, we take our original linear system, our M by N linear system, and we're gonna augment it by adding one row and one column. So in particular, we'll choose a value T between one and kappa that we have control over. 
and we're going to add 1 over t to the bottom right corner of this matrix. We're also going to introduce a new variable, and we're going to add a 1 to the right-hand side in the last position. So basically, we've added one new variable, one new linear equation involving that variable, completely uncoupled from all of the other linear equations in the system. Uh, and we demand that this new equation be true. We call this uh, the augmented linear system, and the solution is xt. So let's take a closer look at the solution xt. Uh, we see that it can be decomposed into a portion which is proportional to the original solution x, and a portion which is proportional to this new basis state that we call en. We call it en because we started counting at zero. So we had n basis states originally, e0, e1, e2, all the way to en minus one. And now we've added a new one, uh, which is en. So because it's within this two-dimensional subspace, we can draw it geometrically uh, as follows here, where it lies uh, at some angle theta t with this uh, en state, uh, where you know, theta t has a t because it's going to be dependent on our choice of t from the previous slide. OK, with this geometric picture in mind, we can now state how the algorithm works. And this is probably the most important slide of the talk. Um, here I've shown for reference the, uh, uh, the, the, the way that the adiabatic solvers work, this uh, image from before, where uh, previous uh, adiabatic solvers would kind of uh, travel from some easy state to the state cat x through this high dimensional Hilbert space. So instead of doing that, we introduce a new vector, a new basis state into our system, which is deliberately orthogonal to the solution cat x. We augment our linear system as described in the previous slide, uh, which implicitly defines a new solution state xt, which makes this angle theta t with the vector en. Now the quantum computer will prepare en into the quantum, uh, into the, uh, quantum register, perform an approximate reflection about this augmented linear system, which makes it stay in this two-dimensional subspace, but rotate closer to the desired state ket x. And then finally, project down onto the original n-dimensional Hilbert space just by measuring this operator, which doesn't cost any queries at all to the input data. So you can see here that, uh, assuming a perfect reflection, we've now obtained the state ket x, although the normalization of the state that we obtain might be less than 1, which indicates that there could be some probability of failure. And there will also be uh, some small errors due to the fact that the reflection won't be done perfectly. Uh, the wiggles in that polynomial will cause it to be a slightly imperfect reflection. OK, so now I've described the algorithm, and we can move on to uh, the complexity of the algorithm. And in particular, what's going on with this parameter t that I said we get to choose? How do we choose t? So the ideal choice for t is to choose t to be exactly equal to the Euclidean norm of x. And why is that? That's because if we make this choice, then the angle here between x, t, and the new solution state, en, is going to be exactly 45 degrees. And when that's the case, if we do this kernel reflection, we'll exactly end up at the desired state, ket x, with no need to repeat the algorithm, because the success probability will be very close to 1. The only reason it's not 1 is because of the, the imperfectness of the reflection itself. This means that the overall query complexity of the algorithm is just one call to kernel reflection. And I guess now I realize I forgot to mention that the cost of kernel reflection is given by this kappa times log 1 over epsilon scaling. That's because the degree of this polynomial that I showed has a linear and kappa scaling and a logarithmic and 1 over epsilon scaling. So the result is that if we do know the Euclidean, the Euclidean norm of x, then we can choose t to be equal to the Euclidean norm, and uh, we can give it a, an algorithm that has optimal asymptotic complexity and also has a constant prefactor equal to basically just 1, so a much smaller constant prefactor than what could be done uh, with the adiabatic method. But of course, we usually won't know the, uh, the, the norm of x uh, exactly. This is sort of would be a very unusual situation. So what do we do when we don't know the norm? Uh, if we know a constant factor approximation to the norm, then this will also be fine. And that's because uh, we won't end up choosing a value of t, which is exactly 45 degrees, but we'll choose a, a value that's sort of constant. And so when we do this process, we'll end up with some uh, constant success probability, and we'll have to repeat only a constant number of times, preserving the asymptotic optimality of the algorithm. 
Here I've plotted the success probability as a function of the approximation ratio between t and the norm of x. So you can see if we have a perfect approximation, we have a uh, success probability one, whereas if we have, say, a factor four uh, approximation, which is too large or too small by a factor of four, the success probability re is reduced to about 20%, re requiring us to repeat the algorithm about five times on average. So yeah, so we, if we have a constant factor approximation, we still have an optimal algorithm. But what if we don't have a constant factor approximation? What if we don't know anything about the norm of x? What do we do in this case? Um, well, first we observe that it will always be the case that the norm of x lies between one and kappa. And that's because we had this promise that a, all of its singular values are at least one over kappa. So when we invert a, we cannot blow up the vector x by more than a factor of kappa. So we know that it lies in this interval. Then the idea is that we can search over this interval for the norm in a geometric fashion. So here uh, we cast these uh, yellow dots are candidate values for the norm, and they're e equally spaced on a log axis. So they form a geometrically increasing sequence. And then we can just exhaustively search over them and recognize when we found a good candidate by the fact that the success probability of the algorithm I mentioned before is high. So we just try the algorithm on all these values and we pick the one with the best observed success probability. Because there's log kappa um, candidates and each uh, uh, detecting whether a candidate uh, is good or not takes order kappa time, the overall complexity is kappa log kappa with an extra log log kappa uh, correction. So it's not quite linear in kappa, but it's pretty close. Can we do better than that? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, firstly, it's kind of immediate to observe that if we just replace our exhaustive search with a Grover search, we can reduce that log kappa to a square root of log kappa almost for free. Uh, secondly, uh, and I won't explain this uh, in full uh, detail, but we can actually do a binary search of these log kappa candidates, which it improves the uh, complexity to kappa, log log kappa, log 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 kappa. So extremely close to linear in kappa, but not quite, not quite linear in kappa. To get the uh, linearity in kappa, we have to do something a bit more complicated uh, and we reintroduce this idea of the adiabatic path, but sort of just for the norm and not for the whole quantum state. So we follow this adiabatic path and we estimate the norm along the path. And we show that this reduces the complexity to strictly linear in kappa, but avoiding the need for any sort of analysis using the adiabatic theorem itself. So if we use this final method for norm estimation at order kappa cost, and then we do the algorithm mentioned before, we end up with an optimal, uh, a, a, a quantum linear system solver with optimal complexity. If you use one of these other methods, we'll end up with a term that's nearly optimal, um, but it's off by this like log kappa factor. Okay, uh, with my last couple of minutes, I just wanna conclude about uh, what we've shown and kind of how we should think about it. So here I'm comparing the explicit bound that we show uh, using the final method on the previous slide, the strictly optimal method for norm estimation, uh, with the explicit upper bounds that were uh, available in the prior literature. Um, so that includes this optimally scaling one and also another one that was uh, slightly suboptimal. You see the kappa log kappa, but was shown to have uh, better constant factors, the better practical performance um, for like actual relevant values of kappa, at least for the explicit upper bound. So we've shown a reduced value for this constant prefactor. Uh, and uh, I believe, uh, and uh, hopefully, hopefully um, uh, you're convinced that uh, the, the reason that this was possible is fundamentally related to the fact that the algorithm uh, involving this norm estimation rather than uh, following the adiabatic path is uh, fundamentally simpler in certain, in certain ways. However, I will note that there's uh, recently been some numerical work on uh, the performance of these algorithms in practice on actual random instances and the actual constant factors that we see for these random instances are much, much smaller. So it, it's sort of unclear what the actual best algorithm in practice uh, will be. But having explicit upper bounds is, is definitely going to be useful uh, regardless of, um, of which one is best because it's sort of nice to know that your algorithm is definitely going to succeed even on an instance that you didn't test for. And uh, as a final comment, I just want to mention uh, that a unique feature of our algorithm is this central importance of the norm. So instead of 
uh, doing this onset state preparation using the adiabatic path, all we have to do is estimate the norm. And this is sort of a good trade because the norm is just a single scalar number that only has to be learned one time, regardless of how many times you want to solve the linear system. And in some instances, we might even have an idea of what the norm is ahead of time, which allows us to get sort of a head start on learning the norm. And then finally, the norm is actually important in its own right, even beyond its use in this algorithm. There's sometimes in an end-to-end -end application where you need to know the norm because you need to multiply by the norm in order to get the quantity you care about. So this was kind of an understudied problem. And uh, it, an additional result that we show, which I haven't mentioned, is if one wants to achieve a one plus epsilon constant factor approximation to the norm, this can be done in order kappa log one over epsilon over epsilon complexity, which nearly matches the lower bound that we show uh, up to uh, a log one over epsilon difference. And yep, that's the end of my talk. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions. Yep, thank you. Uh, here we go. So by the end, you show the Grover search uh, in an attempt to um, improve the asymptotic of your algorithm. So I know that you know your algorithm is not 2D like the Grover search, but I mean it has a feeling of being 2D there. So is there any way to you know it just got feeling, but like to truly like incorporate Grover search in your algorithm somewhere? Instead of yeah. doing it separately. So I think that, that it's true that this this uh, 2D subspace is reminiscent of the way one analyzes Grover's algorithm, but I don't think it's exactly related to this comment. Where here I was just mentioning that we had this like discrete set of candidates, and we're going to do a Grover search over that set, so it'd be kind of looped together with the algorithm that I uh, mentioned before. It is maybe a good question of like, uh, are there other ways to traverse this path in this two-dimensional subspace? You know, let's say you had a very small value of theta t. Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, one, maybe one way you could, uh, you could implement Grover search is if you had a very small success probability, instead of getting a one over p success, you could get one over square root of p success. And that would be kind of, you, like then you would be kind of doing this like reflection business with Grover search within this two-dimensional subspace. So I think you could actually do what you were saying. I see the so point. that's where it would come in. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. And I'm interested in the constant factor analysis that you had the table. Uh -huh. And I was wondering um, which method did you use for the um, estimation of norm of X in the in this ADA yeah. number? So it, the one that we do to show the, uh, this result, it, it most resembles this third bullet uh, that I didn't really explain where we follow an adiabatic path. It's actually a bit more complicated than even what this bullet explains, um, because I was really trying to optimize it uh, as much as I could. Although I do think that there's still quite a bit of room for a better analysis here. Uh, okay. and reduce. So it also involves with some adiabatic process to estimate the norm of X. Yeah, it, it resembles the adiabatic process. It uses the same family of uh, Hamiltonians that kind of approaches the right one that we want, uh, but we, aren't actually doing like an adiabatic evolution. We're really just considering a discrete sequence of points along the path and estimating the norm at each one. And then the norm kind of varies smoothly in the same way that the quantum state would vary smoothly along the path. Okay. So okay. So yeah, I was wondering because the constant work is so different uh, between the methods yeah. and the, the most upper method also uses the adiabatic process. And I, I thought that's, why the constant factor becomes larger, and yeah. do they have any like so, comments on? That? Yeah, yeah. So I I think that the adiabatic any analysis that relies on the adiabatic theorem itself or some version of it is very likely to lead to a large constant factor because the adiabatic theorem is just so general and applies to so many situations that it, it's going to there's gonna be a lot of looseness in in the analysis. So I think the main reason that we Get a much better constant factor, even though we do an adiabatic process, because we don't actually need the adiabatic theorem in the analysis. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Go, have time for one very short question. Um, what's the work on the miracle results you mentioned at the end, the one that compares everything? Uh, yeah. So that's uh, Pedro and uh, Dominic's uh, work, uh, which there was. I was talking to them yesterday because there's a poster. 
about this. And yeah, they were telling me that I was using the wrong constant prefactor actually in this uh, thing. So I, I reduced it compared to what it was yesterday. So this is actually the smaller value. Um, but uh, yeah, but the numerical results are way smaller, like on the order of like 20 kappa or something for okay. these uh, numerical instances. So they're even better than the upper bound that we show. And what's the latest on the proof on theoretical lower bounds? Uh, theoretical lower bounds? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I think we know uh, kappa log one over epsilon asymptotic lower bound, but I don't know if the constant prefactor is anywhere close to tight. I think it probably is not. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.